हेलो हेलो एम आई ऑडेबल Yes, Doctor Moyes, you are audible. Ma'am, shall we start? I think we can wait for uh, uh, two, three minutes more so that other people people can also join. Ma'am, your voice is very. Nine five, we can start. Ma'am, please let me know when to start the presentation. a very good evening and warm welcome to one and all today we are discussing a very interesting topic that is placental transfusion this placental transfusion has fascinated the researchers and philosophers since ages and uh, many great physicians like hippocrates and naturalists like darwin have emphasized the importance of placental transfusion for a neonate despite it being the most physiological method of cord management this practice was abundant for more than 6 decades and it was then replaced by early cord kalama pair ko nikal lo dusra kahan ko baithe please mute yourself please mute yourself moise please mute yourself while joining please mute yourself mute yourself hum kaise karenge okay so uh, despite it being the most despite it being the most physiological method of cord management this practice was abandoned for more than 6 decades and uh, it was replaced by early cord clamping which is an unphysiological intervention that prevents the natural process of placental transfusion so however over the past one decade evidences have reemerged favoring the practice of placental transfusion so in short this placental transfusion is not a new entity it is just an old wine in a new bottle so in today's session 
uh, we have Dr. Moyes, who is a DM resident in Dr. RML Hospital. He will be presenting regarding the importance of placental transfusion, its, its historical perspective, and different methods of placental transfusion, and also the evidence is favoring them. So we will take all the queries at the end of the session. Over to you, Dr. Moyes. Please start. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, respected teachers, seniors, and colleagues. Uh, the topic of today's presentation is placental transfusion. And I'm presenting on behalf of my institution, uh, Dr. RML Hospital. And I my moderator is uh, Dr. Bharti, ma'am. And I'm highly thankful to her for helping me at every stage in, pre in preparing this presentation. So let's just start. So we are going to discuss uh, this presentation under following headings, historical perspective, introduction, physiological basis, different methods of cord clamping, recent evidence and recommendations, and conclusion. So historical perspective. It has been known since ages that placenta is the source of fetal nutrition. But till now, the exact time of cord clamping is not known. The famous Greek philosopher Aristotle had said it is harmful to cut the cord uh, too soon after birth. In 1773, uh, Charles White wrote that common practice of tying and cutting the navel is just a custom and does not have strong evidence in favor of it. In 1801, Erasmus Darwin, and the grandfather of Charles Darwin has said that uh, immediate cord clamping, uh, tying the cord is injurious for the child and the child whose navel has been tied too soon, they are born weak. In 1807, Dr. Thomas Denman wrote in his uh, book on midwifery in that uh, the changes from extrauterine life to, uh, from intrauterine life to extrauterine life are gradual and cord should not be tied immediately, but it should be left until it has uh, stopped pulsating. So uh, natural transition by not clamping the cord until it has stopped pulsating was the norm for centuries. In 1950, Virginia Apgar, due to concerns of placenta transfers of anesthetic, suggested immediate cord clamping. However, concerns were raised in studies in 1962 regarding marked bradycardia. Uh, due to immediate cord clamping. But still the practice did not change and immediate cord clamping continued. The concept of immediate cord clamping further strengthened with the emergence of active management of third stage of labor, which include uh, cord, cutting and, uh, cord clamping and cutting, uh, administration of neutrotonic drugs to mother, and controlled cord traction for placental removal. However, in 1996, WHO has said late clamping is physiological way and early clamping is a practice that needs a justification. Immediate cord clamping disrupts the normal physiological process occurring at birth, which we will discuss subsequent, in our subsequent uh, slides. So uh, let's study some of the facts uh, related to fetal placenta circulation. So uh, by mid-pregnancy, the blood is equally distributed between the two compartments that is uh, placental and fetal. However, near term, uh, the fetal compartment at any time contained two third of the uh, fetal placental blood, while placental compartment contained only one third. So what is the definition of placental transfusion? The uh, placental transfusion defined as transfer of residual placental blood, approximately 30 to 40% to the baby during first few minutes of age. So what are the uh, factors which affect placenta transfusion? These are timing of cord clamping, spontaneous rest, onset of spontaneous breathing, uterine contraction, spasm of umbilical arteries, which reduces the flow of uh, blood from uh, fetus to placenta, and gravity. We'll discuss these factors uh, one by one but we'll concentrate our discussion in this presentation on timing of cord clamping, breathing effort, and gravity, as these are the factors which we can control. So it has been found, first we will see what are the effect of timing of cord clamping. So immediate cord clamping, which has been arbitrarily defined as cord clamping in less than 30 seconds, it leads to a transfer of 70% of blood from placenta to the 
newborn. However, if the rate cord clamping is delayed for about one minute, this amount increases to 80%. And more so, if the uh, delayed cord clamping is delayed for three to five minutes, that this amount increases to 87%. Now, what are the effect of spontaneous breathing effort on placental transfusion? We all know that normal breathing is negative pressure breathing. Spontaneous breathing effort creates a negative pressure, intrathoracic negative pressure. So it creates a gradient in the uh, between uh, placenta and the right fetal heart. So this gradient leads to transfer of uh, blood from placenta to uh, fetus. The neutrine contraction. Uh, prime, they are the primary determinant of placental transfusion in spontaneous delivery with delayed cord clamping. Initial uterine contraction that expels the fetus contribute to 25 to 30% of placental transfusion. Then spasmocomlical artery. Uh, it is interesting to note that after uh, birth, uh, the umbilical vein remains patent while there is spasmocomlical artery. The beneficial effect is that uh, still blood can go from placenta to baby, but due to spasm of the arteries, the blood can't go from baby to the placenta. So this is a natural protective mechanism. Now gravity. It's an interesting subject uh, which uh, has been explored to various extent. So we'll discuss it. So this is a study published in 1969 in Lancet by Yao et al. And they have uh, studied the effect of uh, 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 effect of placenta transfusion at various distance. So they have found that a distance of uh, 10 centimeter above the introitus or 10 centimeter below the introitus does not affect placenta transfusion and the maximum transfusion occurs in three minutes. And they have found that if the baby is raised to 50 centimeters above the introitus, then it adversely affects placenta transfusion. That is no, trans no placenta transfusion occurs. However, if the baby is lowered to 50 centimeter below the introitus, uh, the process got <coughs> expedited and most of the uh, majority of the placenta transfusion occur within one minute. Uh, in the era of uh, uh, in the era of uh, skin to skin contact, uh, a study published in Lancet in 2014, and they have also found that uh, there is no if adverse effect on placenta transfusion by placing the baby either on maternal abdomen or maternal chest. So what are the uh, methods of placenta transfusion? Uh, these are delayed cord clamping, which are which is defined variably as any time which is more than 30 seconds. Upper limit is still not known. Some studies have taken it to uh, as long as three to five minutes, while other have taken it by the time cord stop pulsating. Then another method is physiological based cord clamping. Uh, we'll discuss it in subsequent slide. Then umbilical cord milking, which include intact cord milking, and cut umbilical cord milking. However, cut, cut umbilical cord milking is still in a very nascent stage. So now the question still remains, timing of cord clamping. The ideal timing for umbilical cord clamping remain controversial for both term and preterm units. So uh, we will uh, study uh, DCC versus early cord clamping in term units. Uh, then as we will take our evidence from these two uh, study. One is from Cochrane uh, Database Systematic Review and one of the meta-analysis which is recently published in Pediatrics by International uh, Committee on Lysen Committee on Resuscitation in Unital Life Support Task Force. So uh, first we will discuss the uh, Cochrane uh, database. Uh, so they have uh, published it in 2015 and uh, they have studied the effect of timing of umbilical cord clamping of term infant on maternal and neonatal outcome. So uh, it includes 15 trials involving 3,911 women and infant there. The intervention was DCC for more than one minute to when caught pulsation ceased. This is the range for DCC. ECC, uh, they have taken it less than 60 seconds. The court have been clamped in less than 60 seconds. They have taken it as ECC. Outcome was neonatal mortality, birth weight, hemoglobin level, anemia up to six months jaundice requiring prototherapy and hematocrit values. So uh, this is the forest plot, uh, which shows a neonatal hemoglobin immediately after the uh, <coughs> delayed cord clamping. 
so they have found that there is mean increase in the hemoglobin immediately after birth by 2 grams in the delayed clot clamping group in fact hemoglobin at 24 to 48 hours uh, later they have found that the mean hemoglobin was still higher in that red clot clamping group by about 1.5 grams while uh, iron deficiency anemia at 3 to 6 month they have found that incidence is more in the early clot clamping group so uh, these are the results they showed that in the late clamping group the birth weight was higher the birth weight was taken immediately after the clamping the clot hemoglobin concentration was higher at 24 to 48 hours uh, however this difference doesn't persist for long but they have found that uh, there is improved iron stores in later part of infancy uh, for early clamping group they have found that these babies require less phototherapy as compared to the adult clamping group with regards to maternal outcome uh, there was no significant difference between the groups so uh, this is the meta analysis which is uh, published in pediatrics in 2021 uh, under the elcor so they have taken 46 studies with maternal and infant uh, gestation more than 34 weeks and the total number of subjects were 9159 and the intervention was late cord clamping versus early cord clamping immediate cord clamping versus intact cord milking versus early cord clamping and cut cord milking versus early cord clamping the outcome was survival without neuro disability anemia in early infancy and maternal pph so they have found that uh, admission to nipu was more in the early clamping group and hyperbilirubinemia are uh, treating with phototherapy uh, was <coughs> more in uh, delayed uh, delayed clamping group and they found that hemoglobin at uh, various uh, ages is more in favor is more in it is more in favor of the late clamping group so they have concluded that compared with early cord clamping intact cord milking and cut cord milking probably improve hemo hematological measures but may not affect survival without neuro disability anemia in early infancy or maternal postpartum hemorrhage so uh, they have promoted uh, strategies that they have uh, said that strategies that promote increased placental transfusion may be associated with greater phototherapy use however evidence for or out or outcomes was low or very low certainty then i will dis discuss delayed cord clamping versus early cord clamping in preterm neonates so uh, we will take our uh, 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 discussion from these two uh, studies so first is that this study is was published in uh, 2017 in anegm and uh, they have uh, taken the babies uh, less than 30 delivered before 30 weeks and they have found that there was no significant difference in incidence of primary outcome between infants they have taken the primary outcome as a, a death or major morbidity and so they found that there was no difference in the incidence of primary outcome between infants assigned to late cord clamping group versus immediate clamping group however uh, the mortality was 6.4% in late cord clamping group versus 9% in the immediate clamping group so uh, with respect to primary outcome uh, that is death or major morbidity uh, there is uh, no statistical difference between the two group however for a uh, second isolated death they have taken a secondary outcome and they found that there is statistically significant reduction in the uh, delayed cord clamping group uh, this is a cochrane systematic review published in 2019 which have studied the effect of timing of umbilical cord clamping on the placental transfusion at preterm birth on maternal and infant outcome so uh, they have uh, chosen taken 84 studies which having uh, which was having 5721 uh, babies and they were between 24 to 36 plus 6 week gestation and the range for delayed cord clamping was between 30 to 180 seconds uh, they have found that delayed cord clamping reduces the number of babies who die before discharge as compared to early cord clamping and also they found that adlet cord clamping may make little or no difference to the number of babies with severe intraventricular hemorrhage that is grade three or grade four but slightly reduce the number of babies with any grade of ivh and with regards to uh, maternal uh, with regards to mother there were no difference in the incidence of pph in mother
So uh, death of the baby before discharge was more in the early clamping group. And interventricular hemorrhage, all great, was uh, uh, there was 17% uh, reduction of the IVH in the uh, late clamping group. And with regards, to maternal, with regards to maternal outcome, there was no difference between the two groups. So what are the uh, recommendations for DCC? So uh, various uh, reputed professional bodies have given their uh, different time frame uh, for DCC. So Federation of Gynae and Ops in 2013, they have said that waiting until pulsation ceases before cord clamping in low risk pregnancies. WHO in 2014 said late cord clamping approximately one to three minutes after birth is recommended for all births. RCOG in 2015, they have recommended the cord should not be clamped earlier than is necessary based on clinical assessment of the situation. NICE in 2017, they have recommended cord should not be clamped in first 60 seconds. ACOG in 2020 uh, recommend cord clamping at least 30 to 60 seconds after birth. And RP in 2021, they have uh, proposed clamping the uh, recommended clamping the umbilical cord should be delayed for more than equal to 30 seconds. In call in 2020, said short term and late preterm DCC for more than equal to 60 seconds. Babies born less than 34 weeks, uh, the cord should clamping should be deferred for at least 30 seconds. But there is great variation in the timing of late cord clamping, ranging from 30 seconds to 5 minutes to when cord stop pulsating. Now, DCC in term units requiring resuscitation. DCC is recommended for all vigorous newborn who, uh, for improving hemodynamic stability, present a transfusion. However, maintaining venous return and cardiac output in an asphyxiated or compromised baby is very essential. And uh, DCC can be employed, DCC can be very beneficial in these. Uh, tricky situations. So this lead to emergence of concept of physiological based cord clamping. I will discuss it in our subsequent slides. So what is this physiological based cord clamping? It involves differing the umbilical cord clamping until the newborn has commenced breathing or respiratory support, support has started and the lungs has aerated. Receiving placental uh, transfusion at birth is more beneficial for depressed unit as it prevents hypovolemia and it also uh, it is also a better by providing perfusion to all organs so now we will see uh, we will see what is this physiological based cord clamping in this video Birth is a magical struggle. It is the moment when the baby transitions from the natural support in the womb into having to breathe and live on its own strength. A process involving major physiological changes in the newborn baby. This animation explains what happens with the baby's heart and blood flow during this transition and how the timing of clamping the umbilical cord is of critical importance to the baby's health. Let's first take a look at the heart. In babies and adults, blood flows from the right side of the heart through the lungs to be oxygenated back to the left side of the heart. The left side pumps the blood into the body, providing oxygen and nutrients to our cells. Deoxygenated blood then returns back to the right side of the heart. Before a baby is born, when it is still a fetus safely in the mother's womb, circulation is different. In the fetus, not much blood passes through the lungs. The fetus is not breathing air, and the lungs are filled with fluids. Rather, it receives oxygen-rich blood from the mother's placenta via the umbilical cord. The placenta supplies blood mainly to the left side of the fetal heart, ensuring sufficient oxygen-rich blood is pumped into the baby's body and brains. After birth, when the baby takes its first breaths, its lungs fill with air. These first breaths are crucial to redirect the blood flow to start passing through its lungs to be oxygenated. This leads to steady change of blood flow. It is no longer the mother's placenta, but the blood flow through the baby's own lungs that now provides all the blood to the left side of the heart. The umbilical cord can now be safely clamped, thereby separating the baby from its placenta. 
However, around one in 10 babies do not breathe at birth. For these babies, the umbilical cord is clamped immediately in order to provide urgent respiratory support. The placental circulation is cut off before the baby's lungs fill with air. Because the blood flow from the placenta into the heart is cut off, while at the same time the blood flow through the lungs into the heart remains low, the left side of the heart will not receive sufficient blood. The baby's heart has less blood to pump and starts to beat slower, reducing the flow of oxygen-rich blood into the baby's body. This results in a rapid reduction in the supply of vital oxygen to the baby's organs, potentially causing injury, especially to the baby's brains and intestines. Only after the baby's lungs fill with air, redirecting the blood flow through the lungs, the left side of the heart will again be supplied with sufficient blood to restore heart rate and blood flow. Allowing the baby to breathe before clamping the umbilical cord leads to a steady switch of the blood flow from the placenta to autonomous circulation. This sustains the baby's heart rate and the supply of vital oxygen to its organs, potentially preventing injury and reducing the risk of long-term disability or even death. We are Concord Neonatal. So this video is very explanatory and it has explained nicely what's the physiological base cord clamping. So uh, we'll discuss it further. So it is uh, not, uh, not time-based, but event-based. Timing the ventilation onset with that of cord clamping. Delayed cord clamping after ventilation onset maintain ventricular preload and stabilizes cardiovascular function during the transition. So uh, these are the three scenarios. We'll discuss uh, each of them one by one. So for the uh, first scenario, uh, the placenta is still, uh, this is a, a fetal life. The placenta is there. And we all know that the site of ox, uh, gas exchange is placenta, not the lung. So uh, through placenta, the blood goes into the right heart. From there, it is shunted into via ductus arteriosus and goes into the lower part of the body. And a part and some of the blood goes through foramen ovale into the left heart. And more oxygenated blood is preferentially prefer sent into the upper part of the body, that's the brain. So this is the normal phys fetal physiology. However, uh, if there is immediate cord clamping, then what will happen? We'll see in this scenario. So the placenta has been cut prior to establishment of the spontaneous breathing. So our lungs, uh, they are still not ready to act as a source of gas exchange. Uh, they are uh, because of uh, absence of oxygen, their uh, pulmonary vascular resistance is high. So the blood, uh, which is less oxygenated, goes into the right heart and it, and it also reduces the preload. Once the placenta is cut down, it reduces the preload to the uh, heart. So uh, blood, which is less oxygenated, goes through the right heart, passes through the ductus arteriosus and goes into lower part of the body. And simultaneously, the less oxygenated and less preload goes through foramen ovale into the left heart. And it goes into the upper part of the body, supplying brain and other vital organs. So this uh, diagram clearly shows that uh, cutting the placenta too soon or cutting the cord too soon, uh, cut the placenta uh, circulation. And uh, since the lungs are not aerated, so they have even not taken over the work of breathing. So uh, the oxygenation of the blood is compromised. And this leads to 50% reduction of the combined ventricular output. Now the third scenario, that is uh, uh, when, the, uh, cord has, when the cord has been clamped after the establishment of the respiration shows that lungs have well taken over the function of gas exchange from the placenta. And the uh, blood which is going to the right heart uh, most of it is now going into the lungs for oxygenation. From there, it goes into the left heart, which is a oxygenated blood. And from there, it is going into the upper part of the body. So uh, this is the advantage of uh, physiological base cord clamping that it allows lungs to expand. So uh, it maintains the preload and it provides the sufficient time for, for lungs to take over as the site for the ma main site of the gas exchange after birth. So uh, it is a smoother transition to extrauterine life and emergence of intact cord resuscitation. It leads to wave, uh, pave the way for emergence of intact cord resuscitation in depressed unit. So this is the animal model studied on PBCC. So these are the uh, various tracing of the uh, carotid arterial pressure, pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary blood flow. 
descending out of flow uh, so you can clearly see that there is abrupt change in the uh, tracing after immediate cord clamping this is done in um, lamps into incubated immediately after birth and there is immediate cord clamping so there is abrupt transition in this tracing so there that's showing that there is abrupt change in the uh, these parameters is well and on the right side uh, you can see that after physiological based cord clamping the changes are gradual the changes are not as abrupt as on the left side so this clearly shows the advantage of pbcc that is physiological based cord clamping now uh, these uh, white dots uh, they are uh, please mute yourself while entering into the uh, presentation kindly please mute yourself uh, so these are the uh, I mean, continuing our discussion on uh, physiological based cord clamping so these are the changes in heart rate uh, after physiological based cord clamping and these are the changes in heart rate after immediate cord clamping you can clearly see that there is abrupt transition or there is a, a sudden increase in the heart rate after immediate cord clamping however that transition is very gradual in the uh, physiological based cord clamping group so this is carotid artery flow and pulmonary blood flow you can clearly see that the changes are very gradual in the physiological base cord clamping in these white uh, dots are physiological base and black are uh, immediate cord clamping and they have found that the differences in pulmonary blood flow persist even after 30 minutes after physiological base cord clamping so what is this intact cord resuscitation it is a relatively new concept uh, which allow uh, that cord should be left intact while performing a resuscitation so uh, this is known as con cord and uh, it is a special trolley which allow for uh, intact cord resuscitation the advantage is uh, this is a trolley which can be placed over mother abdomen it has a overheating uh, heat source which maintains the baby's temperature and it has resuscitating equipments uh, the cord remain connected with the baby like this and uh, the resuscitation can be performed if required <laughs> the studies have been found that uh, with intact cord uh, uh, resuscitation uh, the saturation at one minute is higher as compared to the early cord clamping uh, the saturation uh, differences is uh, the saturation values are higher at one minute and 10 minute heart rate at one minute the transition is more gradual in the intact cord clamping as compared to early clamping and timing for first cry and regular onset of breathing is earlier in the physiological clamping group as compared to the early clamping group so newborn infants in the intact cord group started to breathe and establish regular breathing earlier than the immediate cord clamping group so these are the various platform uh, uh, for uh, facilitating intact cord resuscitation one we have already discussed uh, that is a uh, con cord trolley then another is uh, a life start trolley it is fda approved this is life start trolley and this is known as numa cart so this is numa cart these are the uh, various um, uh, trolleys which are there for facilitating intact cord resuscitation so uh, what are the evidence what is the evidence for physiological based cord clamping in preterm infants this is a article which was published in resuscitation in uh, year 2020 and they have taken uh, babies uh, including preterm babies born before 32 week gestation and they have uh, allocated them into physiological based cord clamping group uh, and standard delayed cord clamping group and uh, they have found that uh, the cord was clamped when infant had regular spontaneous breathing heart rate more than 100 beats per minute saturation more than 90% while using fio2 less than 40% in infants receiving bcc the cord was clamped at 32 to 60 second after birth so the result showed that mean cord clamping time was 5.49 plus minus 2.37 minute in physiological based uh, cord clamping group and one uh, 0.02 plus minus 0.30 minute in delayed cord clamping group so they have found that infant receiving physiological based cord clamping need less time to reach respiratory stability as compared to the delayed cord clamping group so they have concluded that stabilization of very preterm infants performing the uh, physiological based cord clamping approach result in considerably longer cord clamping times and is at least as effective as stabilization according to the current routine dcc approach now we we'll discuss what is umbilical cord milking so i'm like placenta transfusion babies needing uterine resuscitation is quite challenging so resuscitation <coughs> uh, the baby should require resuscitation can be provided with a uh, uh, benefit of dead cord clamping by just milking the cord 
so they said uh, they have recommended that uh, we need to milk a segment of 20 to 25 cm and we have to milk it uh, towards the baby and uh, for preterms we need to milk it uh, four times and for term baby we need to milk it five times uh, so what are the potential benefit it provides cardiac preload before removal of the placenta circulation we have already uh, studied this concept in our previous slide they improve cardiac output improve cerebral and pulmonary perfusion and mitigates further ischemia and compromise infant. So uh, this is a diagram which is uh, depicting uh, uh, umbilical cord uh, milking. Uh, so baby is uh, uh, compromised at birth, uh, shown by his blue color, and the cord milking is done immediately. And it leads to a restoration of left ventricular preload. And also uh, it leads to improvement in pulmonary and cerebral blood flow. Now we'll discuss uh, umbilical cord milking versus immediate cord clamping preterm. So this is a, a study done by Katheria et al. Uh, published in 2014. And they have found, they have found that uh, an infant receiving umbilical cord milking has higher heart rate, higher SpO2 over first five minutes of life. Uh, so the physiological parameters are better in the umbilical cord uh, milking group as compared to the delayed cord clamping group, as compared to the immediate cord clamping group, sorry. Then another study uh, done by Katheria et al and published in 2015, uh, they have compared umbilical cord milking versus delayed cord clamping in preterm uh, neonates. And they have found that uh, neonates randomly assigned to umbilical cord milking has higher superior vena cava flow, right ventricular output in first 12 hours of life. Neonates undergoing umbilical cord milking also had higher hemoglobin, uh, delivery room temperature, blood pressure over first 15 hours, and urine output in first 24 hours of life. Uh, this is a study uh, also published in JAMA in 2019, which have studied association of umbilical cord milking versus delayed cord clamping with death or severe interventricular hemorrhage among preterm infants. So uh, the author have found that, uh, and by gestation, they found that uh, gestation from 23rd to 27 weeks, they are the incidence of intracranial uh, severe intracranial hemorrhage is more in the umbilical cord milking group and it is statistically significant. However, for all grade of interventricular hemorrhage, that, uh, they are not statistically significant between the two groups. So, uh, the author has concluded that delayed umbilical cord clamping among preterm infants born at less than 32 weeks gestation, there was no statistically significant difference in rate of composite outcome of death or severe interventricular hemorrhage but there was statistically significant higher rate of severe intraventricular hemorrhage in umbilical cord milking group. Uh, this is the uh, RCT, uh, which compared the neurodevelopmental, uh, which have studied the uh, neurodevelopmental benefits of umbilical cord, delayed cord clamping at 22, 26 week, uh, 22, 26 month of age. So author have found that uh, infants randomized to umbilical cord milking at birth had significantly higher cognitive and language composite scores. And however, the motor function was similar between the two groups. So there are there was better uh, cognitive and language scores in the umbilical cord milking uh, group. Uh, however, uh, the motor functions were similar between the umbilical cord milking group and delayed cord clamping group in preterm infants at 20 to 26 months of corrected age. Uh, this is a systematic review published, uh, Cochrane systematic review published in September 2019. It studied the effect of timing of umbilical cord clamping and other strategies uh, at, on pre in the preterm infant on maternal infant outcome. So uh, they have taken a uh, gestation from 24 to 36 plus six weeks. They have compared late cord clamping versus early cord clamping, late cord clamping versus umbilical cord milking, and umbilical cord milking versus early cord clamping. So they have found that uh, in late cord clamping versus early cord clamping, they found that it reduces the number of baby who die before discharge as compared to early cord clamping. PC may make little or no difference to the number of babies with severe IVH, that is grade three or grade four, and DCC. Uh, has little or no effect on major morbidities. For DCC versus umbilical cord milking and umbilical cord milking versus immediate cord clamping, the data is insufficient to give any confidence.